Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Life in HD, where we have special guests come on and chat with us about human design in real life. And if you're new to this channel, I'm your host, Crystal Alferrero. I'm a human design guide and founder of the Human Design Academy. And today we have a real human design treasure with us. His name is Shane McDermott, who's a 2-4 reflector on the right angle cross of the vessel of love. And he's also a holistic health practitioner. So of course, we'll get to hear all about what it's really like to be a reflector and soak in all of that wisdom. So I'm really thankful and grateful that you're here, Shane. Um, yeah, we'll get to hear all of that straight from a reflector himself. So welcome, Shane. How are you? Very good, Crystal. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really looking forward to just sharing with your audience some real life experiences as, you know, navigating life as a reflector. Yes. I feel like we need to amplify reflector voices. There aren't that many out, <laughs> out there. So whenever we have the chance, um, actually the way that I met Shane was he, well, found my YouTube, he reached out and um, pretty much invited me to have him on. And I had to like, it was just an immediate hell yes for me. Um, <laughs> I found that it was just a great way to, again, hear from a reflector himself. I feel like a lot of the human design information out there are shared by non-reflectors and it's just the way that it is just by, you know, number uh, by, if we talk about probability, <laughs> there are not that many reflector teachers out there. So any chance that we have, um, I'm happy that you're here. And so for People that are watching right now um, that don't know you, I just wanted to start off with like a little introduction, if you can share a little about your background. You know, we were talking the other day and you have a very interesting background. So just sharing a little bit about that. Where are you from? What you do? Yeah, great. Yeah, I feel like I've had a very meandering path through life and that I've sampled many different realities. And that's a big part of it is it, it, curiosity has sort of been my primary drive through life i'm just been deeply curious from a very young child to now i would say sample as many experiences as possible and that led me into so many different areas of study and pursuit and practice that um i feel super fortunate to be able to have mostly just followed my my heart my passion my drives my interests throughout my entire life. Um, I didn't have a lot of pressure from my parents or peers or society to fit in in a particular way. I, my, especially my parents just really were very encouraging me to just follow my interests. And that even going to school, I, I dropped out of school very young and um, because it wasn't interesting what, what they were teaching. It just didn't capture my imagination, my interest. So I started to study what became very interesting to me early on was the human body, just the, the experience of being in a body. So I started studying this uh, at a pretty young age, like 15. It was like, at, at that point, it was more like athletics and bodybuilding and weightlifting and how I could build my body because I was very small and frail as a child so i wanted to build my body so i started studying exercise and different ways of sculpting my body and different ways of performing in the sports that i was performing in i i grew up in canada and i was playing hockey from a very young age from three years old so it was a lot about sports performance uh and so at a pretty young age, my dad and I opened up a fitness center. And when I was 17, we, I started running the fitness center, dad and I. And then by the time I was 24, I took that on myself and moved the whole facility to a different location. And I, and I created a holistic health center at 24 years old. I didn't have really a clue what I was doing, but I think this was the earliest sort of inclination of how I'm able to see or relate to reality in a very different way, because I knew that things like nutrition and exercise and yoga and meditation and acupuncture and massage therapy were all necessary to integrate into one sort of coherent offering. And I learned a lot doing that. I had that facility, that 
business for 17 years before I moved to the States, which I've lived here now for 20 years and really just pursued so many different areas of study, um, different forms of body work, movement therapy, yoga, yoga therapy, lots of different meditation practices, um, Vipassana meditation, Mahamudra meditation, um, Babaji Kriya yoga meditation. And so it just, the more that I learned, the more I realized that the complexity of the human experience, and it kept pushing me into different areas of study, into functional medicine, into um, subtle energies, working with subtle energies in, in healing and different forms of coaching. So now after, you know, 35 years of professional study and practice and pursuit, it feels very integrated and holistic mm -hmm. that because I've been able to sample from so many different paradigms of study and knowledge and practice that it's woven together into a very holistic integrated offering at this point, my coaching work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find that's amazing. First of all, um, you know, we talk a lot about reflectors really needing a good environment in order to thrive, in order to make the right decisions and have different opportunities come about. And I feel like that your background, having a family that supported you from a very young age, allowed you and gave you that space to really bloom and thrive and find your way on your own, you know, discover the different things on your own, obviously, you know, giving you with the different um, opportunities with the, the health practice and stuff like that. But ultimately it's like, you were able to discover so many different modalities, physical and non-physical, um, to create something that's really your own at the end of the day. And I find that's wonderful. So. Yeah. You know, it'd be great if all reflectors could have that kind of support. Mm -hmm. It's also been very difficult. I've been allowed to make a lot of mistakes and, and, learn from those mistakes. I think this is a really important piece. Um, being a reflector, I, well, I, I want to say, first of all, I'm really grateful that I came to discover that I was a reflector at a very mature stage of life. I think had I gotten this insight or understanding of this typology at a young age, it, it probably would, would have been really challenging and problematic. So it's, I'm really grateful that it's happened at a later stage and more of a mature stage of life that I can actually integrate it and use it and see that it's required a lot of personal work. I've devoted, it's, you know, my, my studies and practices haven't just been to craft a professional offering. It's been to really dig into deep into my own psyche and deep into my own soul of how I can heal and grow and evolve. So it's been 35 years of really intense, introspective, personal growth work mm -hmm. that I feel like has allowed me to clean the mirror of my reflectorness from the contaminations and the blemishness and where the mirror was really broken early yeah. on, early stages of life. It was, I was looking I was reflecting from a broken mirror, or a very dirty mirror, and it took a lot of real commitment and dedication to to um, really clean myself and and become more developed and and look at my shadows and look at areas where I was really dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. So that's been really important. Yeah, and I found it really interesting. You know, when we were chatting the other day. Um, what you mentioned around the difference between reflection and, and projection, right. And, yeah. you know, we hear a lot that reflectors are often reflecting us. And so you might have reflectors maybe, you know, experiencing something really heavy that they experience through other people, or perhaps say that it, this is, you know, I'm feeling this, therefore this person that I'm experiencing is this way. Right. Um, did you want to expand on that a bit more, like the difference between, you know, projection and reflection when it comes to being a reflector? Yeah, I think this is such an important point, and it would be the way some of the common sort of fallacies of the reflector, which 
it's partly partly why a big reason why I reached out to you, Crystal, because when I go onto the internet and look at the different uh, human design teachers and they're talking about the reflector, it's sort of a very standard issue um, summary of what the reflector is. And what I'm not seeing in a lot of human design teachers is the evolutionary path of the reflector. That I think there's this granted or assumed wisdom with the reflector that we're reflecting the program and it's never about us and it's always about what the environment or the people or the groups that we're around or the world we're in we're always just reflecting that and i think that's really problematic to me and i will probably get in a lot of trouble with a lot of human design teachers saying this but just i got your back shane <laughs> right on thank you just reflecting on my own life I can really see that early on in my 20s, 30s, what I was, I didn't even know I was a reflector at that point. I knew nothing about human design. I didn't, I didn't really come on to human design until maybe four or five years ago. But at that point, I, now, retrospectively, I can look back and see that what, was, what I was putting into the world was much more of a projection and I don't want that to be confused with the projector type. Mm -hmm. It's different. Mm -hmm. Projection in sort of developmental psych psychological terms is um, our own shadow, whether, whether that's emotional shadow of we're being angry or depressed or anxious. And we take that and project it onto the world around us. So what I, what I think there's a real developmental path that reflectors have to go through that yes, the, the reflector has enormous potential to reflect the capital P program, but I think early on they get stuck in the small P program and start to take that on as a personal identity. So for young reflectors listening to this, I think it's really important that you make a deep commitment to your own personal growth and development to clean your mirror as much as possible, to recognize where there's what I'll call grab or the seduction of the small P program. See, it's like as reflectors, there's not a strong sense of personal identity so that what we end up, the environment we're around, the people we're around, the groups, the situations, circumstances, we can take that on easily. And if we mistake that as our as ourself, that's mm -hmm. really problematic. Then we take that on and start to project it rather than reflect it. Mm -hmm. And this is really important. Then the mirror becomes very dirty or broken of what we're actually reflecting is more of our own addictions around what we've sampled in, in life, the realities, the situations, the circumstances, the relationships that we sample, we take that on and mistake it as ourselves and then start to project that out. And then our, our reflections become very contaminated. Mm -hmm. so I think there's a real need for reflectors spe specifically to really take on the deep commitment of personal growth and development and to constantly be working with their shadows so that we're not projecting onto the world a mistaken identity. Rather, we, we're reflecting the capital P program, which is yeah. radically different. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that wisdom can also be applied to other types as well. Like in human design, yeah. um, there is a lot of empowering language as well. You know, this type is known to be, let's say for example, projectors, they're also known to be intuitive and, and the future leaders of the new paradigm and that type of thing. And we forget that these are all potentials as well. And that we should also, you know, embrace the shadow and it's nothing to run away from. It's nothing to um, deny, you know, we all have our, our, our stuff that we're working through. And I feel like that is, I love that analogy of wiping that mirror clean, right? Just keeping ourselves in check, um, being accountable and, and yeah, accountable for ourselves and the way that we see things or how we might be projecting things as well. You know, we're not perfect. No one's perfect. We're all human. Um, and I, I really like that. Um, so thank you, Shane. 
Uh, and another thing, I guess, to add on to that, did you have any other, are there any other misconceptions in the way that, you know, reflectors are being taught or shared or any other misconceptions that you feel that, um, you know, you want to debunk or what was yeah. I going to say? Yeah. Yeah. Similar to what I was saying, this, this differentiation between assumed or granted wisdom versus acquired or earned wisdom. And that's an evolutionary path. That's, and it doesn't take six months or a year or five years. It's a lifetime. It's a lifetime. Even though I feel like at this state and stage of my life that I am starting to realize more and more potential to reflect the cosmic program, I still have to constantly check myself and clean myself to make sure that there's not projections that I'm making that where this word grab is really important. And I think this is important for all typologies, all the human design types of that notice. There's sort of, I'll break it into three categories. Um, strategic, seductive, and spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Start to notice how we relate to the experiences of life as reflectors. Is there a seduction in what you're sampling? Or is there a strategy in what you're sampling? You're, what you're sampling, you're then sort of manipulating that and developing that into a strategy to move your way through life and get your needs met. What I'm discovering at these later stages of life or more mature stages of life is that when I know that I'm in right, true reflection, is that what I'm sampling feels very spontaneous. It doesn't feel seductive. It doesn't feel strategic. There's not a lot of grab around it. It's sort of like the Teflon mind. It feels like whatever shows up slides off easily. And I don't take it personally. And I don't mistake that as my sense of self. So there's a way that reality, that the reality I sample now has an easy way in and out of my aura. It doesn't stick. It doesn't mm -hmm. stick start to notice where what you sample seems to stick or have grab sort of like velcro mm -hmm. that, that whatever we sample starts to stick and we start to use it strategically or it becomes very seductive i think that's a real red flag for reflectors in particular but all types all types i think we have to develop our body mind and heart to be both resilient and attuned to the spontaneity, to the synchronicity of the capital P program, the cosmic program, so that what we encounter and what we experience um, doesn't stick and doesn't isn't mistaken as our our small self. So I think it's um some of the other sort of pitfalls for reflectors is especially when you read or listen to these extraordinary sort of um, narratives around the reflector is to break the illusion that we're omniscient, that we are all knowing as reflectors, that we're just reflecting the state of the world, the groups, the relationships, and it's always about the other person. It's not, it's not, it can be entirely about us if we're, if we haven't worked through our own stuff and mm -hmm. our own shadows. So to break that illusion and really realize that from granted wisdom to acquired wisdom is a lifelong journey. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Um, and I guess another question I have for you is, you know, as a reflector, you're someone that is here to take your time through these big decisions, take your time through life. Um, so as you know, you've been experimenting kind of with human design for five years now, what is that like for you to, you know, perhaps make a big decision? Let's say start one of your new businesses or one of your new passion projects. Is there a certain process that you go through as you're, you know, waiting that lunar cycle? Do you wait that lunar cycle or do you just kind of have you always naturally 
taken your time throughout things or was that something that was challenging at first? It's both. I think, <laughs> this, I think this is the other reality or my reality of, of working with this type is the paradox, the deep paradox that we live in a sort of human constructed world that is getting faster and faster and faster and more immediate. And to recognize the conditioning around that for all of us of, you know, like imagine not having your cell phone and, and navigating your way across country. It's like how much slower that would have to happen. You'd have to stop and look at paper maps and figure out routes. And we're just so used to this instantaneous um, convenience which speeds our mind, it speeds our nervous system up to this sort of breaking point that we're really staying on the surface with a lot of our decision-making. It's so spontaneous that we're ex the culture expects it, our peers expect it, our social groups expect it, that we're able to respond with immediacy. And I think that keeps us on the surface of life. And I think this is wisdom that I would want to share with all types of slow down, take intentional practices of removing yourself from technology and get more into an analog experience of life rather than a digital experience of life. Slow down and allow important events, situations, decisions in your life to drop in beneath the surface, to drop into the depths and start to really feel I think we're so um, headstrong and and intellectual in our culture that rarely do we actually drop these experiences into the depth of our being and into the sort of cellular experience of our life and feel our way through it instead of thinking our way through every decision. So there's, yes, it requires time. And I feel like this has been a blessing. All the sort of body-based practices and explorations I've done through my life have brought me into this really cellular, neurological, slower waveform of digesting my experiences of life. And that's where I go to. It has to feel right to me. It can't just, I just can't think my way through it. So I drop in, I go into nature with big decisions. I oftentimes, well, another part of my sort of profession has been nature photography, which I've done for 20 years. And that's been a deep spiritual practice for me, even though it's, it's a business. It's, it started out as a spiritual practice when I would, when I would um, be confronted with these big decisions of life, big decisions. What I would do is I'd pack my truck up with all my backcountry gear and I'd go out into the backcountry for a week. Yeah. And I'd go do backcountry camping and photography and meditation and movement and away from all the sort of human constructed realities and drop into the slower waveform, which is my body, which is nature. It's, it's not different. And I would get the clarity I would need there. And that was a regular practice and still is. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. It's funny because I was going to ask you, you know, what do you do during that waiting period? But what you were saying is that it's not about thinking and, and doing anything in particular. Obviously, like you have your ways of dropping into your body, but it's what I'm getting or what I'm hearing from you is ultimately feeling and just feeling the sensations that you might, you know, from the information that you're perceiving from just processing it and letting it kind of work itself out over time. Yes, absolutely. And I think this has got to do with what are we sampling? What is the, you know, if we stay in the human constructed fabricated reality, then what we're sampling largely is the history of humanity. Okay. We can call that sort of the storehouse consciousness of the collective of humanity through all of human experience. If we're just sampling that, if that's the source that we're sampling, then 
all we actually have access to is the history of all the decisions and choices that humans have made and the different strategies that we've adopted as human beings for safety and survival mm -hmm. and creativity. If we can start to sample more of the, that would be small p programming. If we can start to sample more of the capital P program or what I call the cosmic program, mm -hmm. our life becomes much more about mystery rather than history. Yeah. And the difference being if we're just in our mind and we're thinking our way through and sort of um, on this intellectual and archaeological dig into our personal past or into the past of the way humans have done it before us, we're really cut off from the cosmic source. This is what I, I feel like my practice is now as more of a mature evolved reflector is I want to be sampling the cosmic source because everything is whole and complete as it is. Mm -hmm. Bring this into something very practical. When I go into nature and I go into my body, there's embedded levels of intelligence and information that becomes available that I don't need my mind to retrieve. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. If yeah. I'm stuck in my mind and my personality and my mistaken identity of the of small p program that I've been sampling, I'll need my mind, my intellect to go in and retrieve certain um, aspects or coordinates to make my decision. Mm -hmm. If I can release that and go rather go into my body and go into nature and go into the subtle uh, energy fields, there's so much information and intelligence there that I don't need my mind to, to access. It's mm -hmm. all accessible through the body. It's all accessible through our physical body, our subtle body, our energy bodies. And what connects us to that source probably most potently is nature, is the natural world, because our body is an expression of nature. It is the expression of the four elements of water, air, or, or chi, or prana, like a lot of the ancient traditions point to. So when we can come into nature, into a really deeply connected relationship with nature, we can access intelligence and information and mystery to help inform our big choices, big decisions. Yeah. And more we do that, to me, I don't need 30 days. I just need a good, deep connection with nature, with my body, get out of my mind, get out of the seduction and the strategy of the small P program and step into the mystery of the capital P cosmic program. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, when you describe mystery, this is all about that surprise, that signature theme of a reflector, right? Exactly. That's yeah. what you're here to experience, right? Be surprised by the mystery of, of life, of the universe. And um, I really liked what you said around not attaching yourself to that small P programming, right? Is there a certain signpost that you're getting too attached to something or that you're focusing on the wrong thing? Um, you know, is it that disappointment, that not self theme of disappointment, or is it something else for you? For sure. And I love that you brought in surprise. So I'm just going to sort of, tease this apart of the small p program is much more about it has a lot of grab to it very seductive and very strategic the capital p cosmic program is much more about spontaneity and surprise yes you'll find yourself being surprised and so to answer your question specifically yes like what do we how do we know this when we get stuck in the small p program it's this it's this grab of, and we start to see that the reflection becomes very static. Here's a, here's a metaphor or a visual that might be helpful. And I think this would be helpful for all types, but particularly for reflectors. You know, imagine like Buddhist mandalas, very sophisticated, beautiful mandalas, very colorful mandalas where there's just so much sacred geometry and layers and levels. Imagine that mandala turning into a mirror. 
So it's all clear, but it's the complexity and the sacred organization of a mirror that would be like a mandala. It's very dynamic. The reflections from the capital P cosmic program, reflections are very spontaneous, very dynamic, and always subject to impermanence. Small P reflections can be very static and there can be a lot of grab around it that what you know if you if you just hold up a mirror to your chest and you walk through life the reflection is constantly changing constantly changing right it's sort of like looking through a kaleidoscope if everyone that knows what a kaleidoscope is like the smallest turn of a kaleidoscope gives you a completely different pattern of reality and this is what I've come to realize is what the Cosmic P program is. It's very dynamic. I just shift environments a little bit. I shift relationships. I shift contexts of situations and circumstances. And the entire display changes. And that's the spontaneous. That's the non-stick quality to it. Can I just be okay with the entire display changing? If I notice, no, I don't want that reflection. I want this reflection. I, that's the grab. That's the that that's the seduction that I don't want the reflection to change. And this is where it's really important to not take things personally. Yeah. As a reflector, we have a personal identity. Um, I've heard some teachers say that we don't, but I believe that we do. It's a personal identity that evolves from a personal self to a transpersonal or cosmic self. And that's a, a lifetime path that mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't stop until you've taken your last breath. And then you just become the cosmic program. So we have an opportunity in this body-mind form to evolve from a personal identity mm -hmm. to a cosmic identity or a personal projection to a cosmic reflection. Yeah. And to start to notice where we get stuck, where, because again, it's this, mis, this, this history and mystery. In the mystery, or sorry, in the history, things become very sequenced and strategic, very... Um, linear? Linear, exactly, very linear, yes. So start to notice if your reflections or what you think are reflections are becoming very static, linear, sequenced, predictable, then there's grab. This is a mistaken identity. And this is hard as reflectors, because, and especially in this culture where we are taught to, you know, now we have to take on this persona that we present to the world through this digital interface mm -hmm. and to realize and recognize the limitation of that and how static that is, that to allow that to evolve into a very fluid self-sense that is very dynamic, very spontaneous, very synchronistic. And the reflections are constantly, constantly changing. And to not take it personally, mm -hmm. this is the transpersonal nature of and potential of reflectors, is yeah. to become very transpersonal and, and to not take it personally. Mm hmm. Yeah, I feel like I'm learning a lot about that through my G center, my undefined G center as well. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And I like that you kind of you run the word impermanence and that describes it perfectly because I'm someone that has gone through so many identity crises <laughs> in my yeah. life. And even now, um, when it comes to like simple things in business, like branding, um, I'm someone that always goes for the neutral colors because it's one thing that's kind of a classic for me. If I commit to any specific color that I feel like defines who I think this brand should be, it just ends up being like, I get sick of it or, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know if that kind of relates, but, um, yeah, I, I, I totally resonate with the idea of impermanence and not really attaching yourself to any one thing, any one identity sense of self. Even now, I feel like I'm rediscovering myself living in a different country speaking a new language being immersed in a new culture it's like yeah I, I feel like I'm a teen again like or I feel like I'm being reborn again in a different you know in a different lifetime um if that makes sense it totally does yeah yeah 
And, you know, it, it's tricky in this culture because now we don't only have to have a personality, we actually have to brand our personality, mm-hmm. yeah. and, which can create this reification. And what I mean by that is sort of like a crystallization of self, where yes. now that self, self sense becomes static, it's fixed, it becomes a fixed point in time and space. And this is another sort of quality of history is that when we look at history, everything has sort of solid temporal and spatial coordinates to it. We just have to look at human history, wars and the the history of famine and, and empires rising and falling. And we can clearly see on a very linear timeline, a temporal and spatial coordinate for everything that we know has happened in the human experience. From the mystery, time and space collapse. Mm-hmm. There is no temporal and spatial realities. And this is where, you know, even that notion of I need 30 days or a full lunar cycle, it's valid, it's valid. But I also think that we can get to the point if we step into mystery and into this sort of impersonal nature, mm-hmm. cosmic self, we don't need time. Mm-hmm. Time and space cease to exist. And it's not that it's anything that I can say about it is sort of going to is inadequate because in the mystery, when we can fully release and surrender to the cosmic intelligence and cosmic information of what wants to emerge in our experience in the, in, for the species of, of all humans, it's a deep mystery. It's a deep Mm -hmm. mystery. And there's an intelligence there that we don't, our mind will actually just get in the way of. Yeah. So really practicing that transition, crossing that threshold from personal identity to transpersonal identity, from small P program, small self to capital P cosmic program. Mm -hmm. More that we can inhabit that space, we all become clearer in whatever type we are, but especially as reflectors, then we can start to really reflect um, something quite extraordinary that is very holographic and very holistic, meaning that it sort of like becomes another metaphor of um, a house of mirrors. Yeah. That every single reflection reflects, every part of the reflection reflects the whole. Mm-hmm. It's very fractal. Mm-hmm. Instead of a static mirror that we're holding up to the world, and we like some of those reflections, so we'll hold on to those, and we don't like other reflections, so we try to get rid of those. Instead of one sort of fixed mirror that we sort of cherry pick the reflections from, we release that and start to become this mandala mind that reflects and the the fractal nature of of reality the holographic nature of reality then what we sample starts to become we can start to learn patterns of how evolution unfolds Mm -hmm. what is in store for our lives for our communities for the larger context of humanity that it becomes very holistic meaning Every the whole is embedded within every part. Mm-hmm. On the small p, every part is separate and fractured from the whole. From the large p program, every part is an expression of the whole. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That makes love sense. That. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, and so for people that are not reflectors how can they um best support the reflectors in their lives is there anything that you wish you would have had more of growing up um you know being a reflector that would you know help you thrive in different ways yeah geez that's a really good question um what probably in my 30s and 40s I would have said yeah there's a lot of things I would want to have had differently or done differently or been supported in different ways. But now I can start to really see, accept, and appreciate 
the sort of as is nature of my life that it had to unfold as it did to bring me to this point so there's not a lot of regrets there's not a lot of things that i would want to do over or you know a take two on it's it's absolutely essential my life has been absolutely essential all my experiences both traumatic and and wonderful have sculpted me to to this point that's for me personally what i would say if there's people watching this with children that are reflectors i think there's to see that their life path or young reflectors watching this your life path is going to need to evolve and grow your capacity your potential as a reflector is going to need to grow and evolve to really let go of the illusion that you can reflect the cosmic program at this point highly unlikely you're going to have a lot of cleaning up to do a lot of cleaning up a lot of growing up a lot of waking up to do in order to have your reflection be um, largely uncontaminated it's a lifelong path so to take your personal growth and development seriously and to keep cleaning your mirror and repair it if it's broken and really work give yourself time and space find your practices i think nature is a and it's a big part of my coaching is to come back into right relationship with nature which means right relationship with all the elements earth which is food water which is hydration um fire which is light and illumination and awareness and air which is the constant shift of of self sense that nothing is imper nothing is permanent it's constantly in flux mm -hmm. and to really come back into right relationship with your body with nature so that you can find your ways into accessing clarity and because it's not going to be probably not you're probably not going to find these really deeply rooted wise ways in the human constructed reality you're going to have to transcend that and drop into non-physical realities, non-ordinary, non-human realms of connecting to self, connecting back to soul. That's mm -hmm. where you're going to find the clarity. That's where you're going to find the capacity to really clean up your reflection. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you feel about environment when it comes to reflectors? How big of a of a role has environment um played in your life in terms of like have you noticed when you're in the wrong environment and you're like your body's telling you get the hell out of there what does that feel like yeah well, i'll give you a good example you know growing up on vancouver island i i grew up in a town of 1500 people so it was oh, well. nature yeah. all around we would go out into the mountains and go out into rivers and lakes and but there was always the seduction of the big city, which was Vancouver, which is on the mainland. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, my friend would be like, let's go party over in Vancouver. And it's like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And, you know, it was the seduction. It was the grab. It was this sort of small P programming. I was letting the my peers sort of define me as to what was right for me. And I would go along. And I would go over there and it was always disappointing, always yeah. without fail. <laughs> because I get into the city of, you know, 3 million people and just feel completely overwhelmed. It was way too much energy. And I get into party situations or nightclubs or um, festivals and it would just feel so burdensome that it was like, what am I doing here? Why did I agree to this? It, it really felt like a deep violation, that kind of environment. I know for me, it doesn't work for me at all. What feels right for me is getting away from people and going into the backcountry, going into nature. And now I've been able to find that middle road. I appreciate what you said about the neutral colors of what you choose for your brand, <laughs> because it gives you latitude to move. It, it, it's not fixed. 
Mm-hmm. And what I've had to do now is find the middle road to where I can be engaged in social situations and not feel overwhelmed because I have what I know is my centering practice is my way into deep grounding and um, and being resourced by source instead of being resourced by these fragments of the small p program Mm -hmm. i gotta be i gotta remain resourced in source itself or what i would call true nature yeah and that that's just really important for me so environment has been really really important and i'm super grateful that my dad especially but both my parents introduced me to nature at a very young age and we we grew up i grew up in calgary and then moved to vancouver island but in calgary till I was 16, we would go out into Banff National Park camping almost every weekend throughout the spring, summer, and fall. And it was just so regulating to my nervous system. Start to notice what creates and causes dysregulation in your nervous system and what brings you back to regulation, where you feel centered, grounded, clear. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to discover as, as reflectors and all human beings but yeah. particularly important for reflectors. Absolutely. So environment I, is super important. Yeah. I've actually heard that um, piece of advice from, I forget who it was. It was probably one of my mentors, but you know, if you ever have a chance as a reflector to go out into, well, again, nature or just kind of isolate yourself, if that makes sense, away yeah. from you know the human conditioning for a period of time, that's where you really get to get in touch with what it feels like to be you. I mean, obviously there's still the cosmic influence there, um, but it's, you know, I've heard that it's a a special experience. Is that something that you've been able to do? Yeah, I think there's two ways. What I've really emphasized to this point has been my connection and relationship to nature, to the natural world. But what has been equally and probably even more profound is been my relationship to the non-physical or metaphysical world through my meditation practices. I've I've been a very committed long-term meditator for now 30 years. And that's just a daily part of my practice. And that opened up sort of non-ordinary, non-physical dimensions of reality that would clearly transcend the sort of human conditioning. From a pretty young age, I started when I was like 25, 26 and have been deeply committed to that my whole life. And this is where it feels like I have now such um, easy and sort of permanent access to what I would call source that I can clearly differentiate when I get caught in my mind or the human conditioning as opposed to when I'm resourced from source. So that's really important because we have to get past the chatter of the discursive mind and all the conditioning that happens at the level of the mind. We have to learn to drop through that and into a quietude and stillness that we don't may, may actually not need to go out in nature. You know, if we were living in huge cities where we don't have access to nature, we can still access this deep quietude and stillness but we have to transcend this, the conditioning and the static distortion of our conditioned mind. Mm -hmm. Meditation is a great way of doing that. It's not the only way, but it's a great way of doing, and that's been my way. So it's those sort of two, two peers of my connection with nature, the physical reality of it and the energetics of nature and this meditative path of connecting to sort of non-physical non-ordinary states of consciousness. Yeah. So essentially, well, what I'm getting from this is getting quiet enough to, you know, not maybe block out all the noise or cleanse out all the noise, if that makes sense. Um, so that you can hear, or you can connect to that non-physical, right? Yeah. It's tricky because even after 30 years of meditation, yes, there's periods of time where I can access, you know, no thoughts, but that's not the goal or the objective of meditation. 
it's to recognize the essence beyond the thoughts, the quietude beyond the thoughts. So this again, nature is such so brilliant at this. You just go out into nature and you listen to the sounds around you of the wind, the, the leaves rustling, the birds chirping, animals walking in the forest, insects crawling, flying through the sky. And you start to notice the space in between. From the sort of normal conditioned mind, there is no space in between and it's getting fuller and more congested. At the level of the mind, our, our, our human constructed reality is so full of distortions that we don't notice the space in between our thoughts. We don't notice the space in between anything. The space is completely filled. It's this neon pulsing, throbbing um, projection of human life. Mm -hmm. And with meditation, what meditation provides us is the opportunity to start to notice the space in between the space in between our feelings, the space in between thoughts, memories, ideas, concepts, sensations. And we start to notice just bringing our attention to the space in between, the space in between, the space in between, which is timeless and spaceless. Then we can start to notice, oh, actually all thought is an emanation from that quietude, from that stillness, from that space. Mm -hmm. become more attuned to and actually identified with the space in between thoughts than the thoughts themselves. Yeah. If there's no space. All we see and notice and hear is thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can drop in. It's not that the, we have to get rid of the thoughts. That's not the objective here. We just start to notice, oh, the quietude, the stillness, the space is actually an, an emanation or an expression of that space. Yes. That's, that's a profound way of cleaning up our persona, our small self personality. I think that mind mindset shift around, you know, because when we think of meditation, or at least if you're not you know, you're not someone that does meditation often, or you're new to meditation, there's this idea that we use it to shut off our minds. And, you know, for me, especially as someone with a defined head and ajna, that's like impossible. Well, <laughs> it's just very, very difficult. Um, and so when I had a Vipassana practice, it was like, I, I started that when I was in the nine to five still. And I remember I would always like, I was just on like really, really fast walking really quickly. Like I always had somewhere to go. My mind was like racing all the time. And I was just in that very, very stressed out state. Um, it was meditation that helped me get to that quietness. It was the very first time that I experienced something, you know, I don't even know how to describe it metaphysical. If you want to describe it like as that, you know, the different sensations that you feel. And that's kind of what opened me up to my, you know, just kind of going deeper down the rabbit hole into my own spiritual path. Um, but it's true. It's like, if by giving yourself that space to notice what you're saying, the space between your thoughts, um, that's where a lot of truth can really emerge for you. And that's where we start to realize what actually does matter, where we're just kind of getting too attached to that, you know, the constructs that we're living in right now, <laughs> right? The material world um, yeah. and knowing where to let go and surrender as well. Yes. And that's the space of mystery. Mm -hmm. That's the space of, of, of deep mystery of not knowing. And that requires a radical surrender and letting go and just accepting things as they are. Not that they we can't work towards shifting them. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we need to work towards shifting this world. We're in a pretty dismal state. But there's also, as we, from that space, from that quietude, from the essence of which all form arises, we can then take much more affirmative, intelligent action that is actually cosmically informed, then, then it's in that, because it's from the same space, the same quietude that 
sort of this evolutionary impulse or evolutionary intelligence or information emerges, that's what we can then start to tap into. And that can inform our choices. Everyone, not just reflectors. Mm -hmm. Everyone has this capacity. But if we can't get past the surface distortion of the mind and this sort of hard shell of continuous thought, we can't penetrate that then all we have access to is what we've already done. What we've done personally, what humans have done previously. And we just keep repeating the same patterns, the mm -hmm. same patterns. Mm -hmm. So it becomes real, a real opportunity to drop into the, to our own mystery, to the mystery of our souls, of what we're really truly here to do. Not some strategic conceptual idea that the world is telling us we need to do, it will come as radical surprise, radical surprise, and, and feel quite intimidating oftentimes mm -hmm. to be able to reflect that because it requires us to let go. It requires a sort of dissolution of personal identity. Yeah. On more of a cosmic identity, a cosmic will that's, that doesn't need us mm -hmm. it can work through us and be expressed through us but it doesn't need a personal egoic identity it's actually really problematic yeah and i feel like everything that you're saying that's exactly what human design tries to help people do right fall more into um their body and what their body's intelligence is telling them as opposed to trying to create from the mind Right. Yes. What we think we should do, what we think we, sh where we think we should be, um, et cetera. Yeah. It's such a great point. And I'll, and I'll give you a way of how I work with this in coaching, helping people become more embodied. We can think about, think about um, the ideas or the concepts around proper nutrition, proper rest, proper exercise, um, proper rest, proper ways of moving our body. If we think on the level of the mind, we go back into the history of, well, we could go look on Amazon and find 10 books on how to eat right, different diets, how to sleep and how to rest, how to, um, how to move our bodies properly, how to be in right relationship. If we actually just drop into our bodies, this is such a huge challenge and obstacle for people especially when it comes to nutrition we have ideas on the level of the mind of what we should be eating and not checking into how our body actually responds to food that's the intelligence if you want to understand how you need to eat drop your awareness in the, into the intelligence of the body and start to recognize how your body responds to movement how your body responds to rest how your body responds to nutrition to hydration, to play, beyond the concepts of the mind. This is, our bodies know. I mean, it, every other creature on the planet doesn't have to think like impalas or zebras or lions or elephants on the savannah don't have to think about what they're going to eat, when they need to move, when they need to drink. It's an intelligence embedded within their body that discloses this. We get in the way with our minds and, and create all these concepts around health and what it means to be healthy. And we impose these concepts on our body and our bodies suffer. And mm -hmm. we become more and more disconnected from the intelligence of our bodies. Our bodies know when to drink, know when to move, know when to sleep, know when to eat, know when to play, know when to come into love and intimacy. Our bodies know all that, knows when we need to be in nature. Yeah. But we disconnected and cut ourselves off from that cosmic intelligence of our bodies through concepts, constant thinking. Mm -hmm. that we know it's yeah. this diet. That's what my body needs. No, it doesn't. What does your body have to say about that? Yeah. Oh, I've definitely learned my lesson around that. You know, with my defined mind, I've been 
Um, you know, I've had times where I was very, I was also into bodybuilding at a certain point in my life, did like competitions and stuff like that. Um, it a very, like had a very restrictive, strict lifestyle. Um, and that kind of messed with me afterwards, right? Yeah. Like it, I don't know if it created or just exacerbated the problems that I already had around nutrition and food and eating from before, but, um, yeah, it's like my body just needed my mind. Well, actually, no, my mind was telling me that I needed to do this. I needed to, um, do things perfectly, measure things out perfectly and all that. And my body was just like, what the hell are you doing? Crystal <laughs> stop. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And yes, yeah, and like, I know when I stopped, it, I just rebounded completely. My body was just like, needed all the nutrition it, it could get. Right. And it just, it took me a while to heal from that. Yeah, no, we set ourselves up for a lifetime of suffering sometimes by our, by what our conceptual mind imposes on our bodies and what can, our culture imposes on our bodies. I mean, particularly for women, it's so problematic. Mm -hmm. the, the ideals of what our culture projects onto women and wonder why is there's so many body issues, body image issues. It's we're caught in this sort of massively distorted collective psyche of what our bodies are and what they should be. And we have to find ways of dropping beneath that cultural and personal distortion fields, dis reality distortion fields, mm -hmm. and dropping into the intelligence of our body so our bodies can start to inform us of what and when to eat and how to move and how to rest and how to be in relationship with nature. This is all the mystery. And we, but we have to access that space in between yeah. and drop into the felt sense of the body and let go of this grip of incessant thinking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we're coming to an end now. Um, I wanted to know if there's anything that you would like to share, if there's anything else that, um, you know, you want other reflectors or even non-reflectors to know about reflectors that you haven't mentioned already. Um, but I yeah. love the wisdom that you're sharing so far. Like, I feel like I, I definitely need you back <laughs> okay. on at some point. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of notes that I wrote here. Um, I just want to check in on. No worries. I think I've covered a lot. Um, yeah, I just want to remind reflectors, especially young reflectors, that what you have is potential wisdom. It's not, it's not, and, and to really make that differentiated between granted wisdom and earned and acquired wisdom, that because you're a reflector doesn't give you a free pass into all knowing, you have to do your work. Mm -hmm. You have to do your work. You have to do your shadow work yeah. to constantly make this as your sort of mantra as a, as a reflector. I must constantly be cleaning my mirror, constantly re cleaning my mirror. And to realize that no reflection is static. Mm -hmm. No mirror reflects a static representation of life. We're moving through life. The reflection is constantly changing. So notice where you become stuck in whatever you're reflecting. Because that's taken on as a bad case of mistaken identity. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's particularly important for reflectors, but I would say that's important for all types. Oh, yeah. Our whole evolutionary path potential for humans is to move from a very static personal sense of self to a very fluid, dynamic, cosmic sense of self mm -hmm. in, in which all types can have access to this deep, mysterious, inherent intelligence built into the fabric of the cosmos. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love just listening to you go on your reflector uh, 
I don't know if they're what you call them, reflector flows. <laughs> right. <Reflector> yeah. flow. <laughs> uh, well, I just want to say thank you so, so much, Shane. Like having you here has been really, really valuable. And I know a lot of reflectors who are looking for this type of information, you know, hearing from other um, projectors who have done the work, who are doing the work, you know, continuing to commit to embodying what it means to be um, a reflector as well. So you're a great example for um, a lot of people out there. So thank you so, so much. Um, and yeah, I'm definitely going to have Shane back, you guys. So this is not going to be the end. <laughs> great. Maybe next time we could dive into sort of the transits because we didn't touch oh, yeah. on That's super important. Yeah. And something that I've been working with recently, and it's given me a lot of clarity of just that's the sort of kaleidoscope of as these transits move through my my sort of makeup it's the kaleidoscope constantly shifting and the light and expression completely shifting so maybe we can get into that next time yeah um, so if you so if you want to learn about transits and have this chat with Shane again leave a comment down below type in transits let us know and either way we're going to do it so <laughs> Awesome. Amazing. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you, Crystal. It's been a real pleasure spending this time with you and getting to share. Amazing.